Okay, the last session of the day is um, um, credit, what consumers need to know. And so, um, just first of all, you should know that I work for the Office of Financial Empowerment at the Bureau, uh, which is focused on low-income and economically vulnerable consumers. And as you might imagine, lower-income people tend to have, um, oftentimes, less opportunities to use credit and oftentimes less credit worthiness in the, in the score, scorable sense. Um, and so that makes it a challenge because let's face it, everybody in this room is, is in some way used credit. Uh, they either have a credit card, they bought a car, some of you bought homes. There's other ways that you're using credit all the time. You may have store credit cards or whatever. Uh, but one of the things that we found, um, we did, a, uh, did some research, released a report in 2015 with a follow-up uh, in 2016, was that approximately 26 million adults, that's about 10% of the population, are basically what we have called credit invisible. And that sounds like a pejorative term, and it, it feels like a negative way to refer to folks. But in fact, in terms of credit scoring, their ability to have a credit score, they don't have enough credit history in, in, in order for them to be scored. So for the credit scoring agencies like FICO and, and things like that, they're unrecognizable. So in other words, if they went and applied for credit, they applied for a credit card or for a loan, they wouldn't have any record by which a lender could score them and understand what their, quote, risk is. Another, another 19 million people have thin files, meaning they, they have some credit history, but not enough to have a credit score. And so you're talking about 40, 46, 45 million people that have difficulty, either have no credit history at all, or have limited credit history and are difficult to be scored, which means lenders have a, have a difficult time making a judgment about their credit worthiness. And as a result of that dynamic, what happens is a lot of those folks, when they actually need to borrow money, uh, have to go into, the, into credit markets that are very high cost. So they have to take out payday loans instead of going to a bank and get a loan. They have to, do other, they have to make other choices in their life because they don't have access to credit. Uh, so credit is really important. It's not only important because you need to borrow money, but if you think about it, people that don't have a credit score or that have poor credit Oftentimes, uh, there's other ways that your credit score is used to make judgments about you. So employers oftentimes pull credit reports. Uh, uh, landlords, before they rent to you, pull your credit report. There's other ways that credit reports are used, not just for borrowing money. So it's important for people to be able to not only have a credit history, and have, but to build good credit. And a lot of what we're going to hear about today from these great four great panelists is about different aspects of accessing credit. So I want to introduce the panel to you. We have four great uh, presenters. Uh, first of all is going to be Julie uh, Griffith, who's uh, the Director of Money Management International. She's devoted a long professional career to making healthier, wealthier communities. Julie has presented to and coached thousands of people and uh, also one of her highlights is she's a financial coach to NFL players. Does that mean that Russell Wilson is one of your clients? No? I cannot verify. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't think she was going to be able to answer that question. Anyway, uh, so Julia will come first, and she's going to talk a lot about credit reports and scores. So some of the stuff that I had just been talking, made reference to, she's going to talk in more detail. Then we'll have Tony Leahy, who's uh, the executive director of Sense. Uh, is the chair, also chair of outreach and education committee of the student loan work group, and he's designed several consumer education and protection programs, and he is here to talk about sense student loan related programs and projects. And student loans are are a critical thing. I mean, the prevalence of student debt is now. I think the student debt market now outweighs uh, is larger than the mortgage market in terms of the amount of student indebtedness. So. It's 1.2 trillion. 1.3 trillion dollars or something like that. So Tony's Tony's going to talk about that. Then we have 
Elizabeth Escobar, who is uh, uh, from a, uh, an institution that I think highly of because I had something to do with starting it up uh, called Express Credit Union. And uh, she's been Express for six years and she advocates for uh, members to ensure that they're also, uh, that they're offered fair and affordable financial services. And she's willing to go the extra mile to make sure that they understand what their credit and budgeting needs are. And she's going to call, talk about personal and short-term loans. And then finally, we have Melody uh, Da, who's from Homesite. And Sorry, I have it in writing. Yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Melody is going to talk about mortgages. Thank you. So brief bio on Melody. She uh, has over 10 years' experience with credit and financial fitness education and coaching and counseling in over 17 years of for-profit and non-profit mortgage experience uh, with first and subordinate mortgages lending for low, very low, low and moderate income level consumers as well as market rate individuals. And she's a certified housing counselor, a licensed loan originator since 2010 with underwriting and, per, uh, and processing background. And she manages home sites, uh, home buyer services and lending program including program development partnership development, outreach, monthly reporting, and oversight. So uh, let's start with Julie, and uh, why don't we try to hold questions until the end, unless you have a burning question after each presentation. So, Julie? Well, after the last session, I'm kind of excited that my ex-husband has an unhealthy lifestyle. Let's <laughs> 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 do my calculations. Where's the other mic? Okay. So normally this presentation takes me about 45 to 50 minutes, so this will be really, really quick. Uh, so as Dave explains, there are lots of reasons why we really focus on credit reports and scores. With my clients, I try to get them not to think about the actual score aspect of it, but really focus them just on the credit report. But also understanding what a lending institution would like to see or an employer would like to see. So lots of different reasons why we use credit reports. I, you did receive a booklet. I think I saw some of those booklets, credit reports and scores. So there's a lots of great resources in here for you. Uh, all right, if you ever go to our website, which is moneymanagement.org, it is um, huge. And I've never been through the whole website. That's how big it is. You are more than welcome to use any of those resources. We are a nonprofit 501c3. Uh, we are based out of Sugarland, Texas. I am based out of Spokane, thank goodness. Uh, Texas is not my favorite place. So why is credit important? You know the answers to this because it kind of makes your wheels turn, right? In doing everything that you want to do. And so we give some examples up on the screen, as Dave mentioned, certain job opportunities. Around 2010, it seemed like almost all employers were pulling credit reports as part of the application process because they had so many people applying, it was just one more way to weed out folks. Better rates on loans and credit offers. It also gives you more access to products as you build up that credit score. Uh, of course, your interest rates are going to be fantastic as your score goes up. Your housing options go up. This is a big stickler for a lot of folks in trying to rent an apartment. If you don't have a good credit score, you're not going to probably live in the best neighborhood as a result. So with credit agencies and bureaus, so we're talking about Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, and there is a fourth one called InnoBiz, but we don't talk about that one too much. They just maintain data on you and everybody else who has credit transactions, and that's it. If you do not have a credit file, it typically means that you have not utilized credit or you've let your credit lapse. And it could be that maybe you haven't used credit for 10 years, and so you're not going to have a, a credit file because it will actually disappear. They do, not, they do not make lending decisions, 
So that is the bank or the credit union that's going to make those lending decisions. And what they do is they scour their servers for information matching the data points that you provide, and that's what's going to be report, reported in that report. So they don't have an existing file on you per se, and that's why that file changes. And it's also different for each credit bureau as far as the information that gets parked on that credit report. And that's why it's important that you check all three credit reports every year. And by the way, credit reports, I, I've heard is they have er errors as high as 70%. That was seven zero. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that maybe things have not aged off your credit report that should have aged off your credit report. Uh, it could be that they just gathered someone else's information and parked it on your credit report. How many of you have a common name? Oh, the rest of you are pretty darn lucky. Uh, there are at least five Julie Griffiths in the Spokane area, so that can be problematic for me at times. Though I like to think that I'm the most famous, but maybe not. <laughs> so to obtain your credit report or for your, your membership to obtain, to obtain their credit reports, you want to really focus on annualcreditreport.com. That is the place to go, so that's really the central clearinghouse, what's required by federal law for consumers to have access. They make it super easy. You do want to make sure that your your members do go to uh, or use a private. I don't know what you you would call it. The library, or do you have like a private? What would you call that service? So if you're going to go up on the, and I was up here looking at the computers. It was pretty cool. Um, but you need to have a private system, a secure system, in order to download your credit reports. And I know like in the Spokane uh, library, they have a secure portal to do that. So I'm hoping that you have a secure portal as well. Uh, the population I work with, that oftentimes they're unable to get the report online because of their housing history. And so even when they mail in their identifying information, they may never get a report. Do you have any comment about that? That is a common problem if people have moved around a lot or if they're transient. I would encourage them to call. They are going to have to prove who they are, which could create some hoops. But there are some services too, like community action programs, that can help them to access those credit reports as well. Can you say what those are again? The community action programs. Community action programs. Where would I find more information about that? Does anyone know? Because I'm not from King County, which one it would be in King County? Actually, I think if you I think if you um, contacted Alice, who was here earlier, from um, she would have a list of community action agencies in this area uh, that could help people with uh, getting access to their credit scores. Also, I and I'm not Elizabeth. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think that's possible that ex the folks at Express might be able to help as well. If they, if, they, if they were to apply for a loan. Yeah, right. Okay. So, but, but Alice may be able to help with other agencies that could, um, that could help folks getting access to their credit scores without necessarily having to be uh, a borrower at Express. Yeah. Also, go ahead. I, I just wanted to mention, um, HUD approved housing counseling agencies can assist clients with that too, sometimes directly in their office. They could pull that report online in their office or they could work to help them compile that info when they get a counseling session. And our agency is a head approved housing counseling agency, and you can do a free counseling session with us. We cannot give you a paper copy by law. We can't give you a copy, but we can tell you what's on your credit report. So it is a free service. So do encourage folks to review that credit report for errors, get it cleaned up. I've had clients improve their credit score by as much as 250 points just by cleaning it up. So it's really considerable because um, it, it, it's a huge game, game changer for you. We do have, um, you can put a consumer statement on your credit report. I do want to point out that this is never usually a good idea. And our example that we use in our book is a perfect <coughs> reason why. And it says, I was injured on a job and could not make my car payments in 2007. Uh, so 
if an employer were to look at this, would they hire this individual? No. So you never know who's looking. So just don't put it in there because it really doesn't affect your score at all. And oftentimes people want to explain medical related debt because that's typically how people drown. You can dispute errors directly through the credit bureaus. It's really easy. You just hit a tab, put the dispute in there. You can say something like, that should have been off my credit report after seven years because it was a collection. Please remove it. So it can be really simple things, but you may have to provide some documentation, which you can also upload. And the book will explain more as to how to dispute things on your credit report. So now we'll go to what people consider the holy grail, the credit scores. I think that we've really pushed this as a society because it makes really good commercials. <laughs> you know, be careful who you date, those kind of things, or be careful who you marry in Washington State, uh, in that case. So this is just a general guideline as to how scores are configured, and really, the one, the inventor of the credit score is FICO, the Fair Isaac Company. I like to focus my clients on FICO because that's typically what banks and credit unions use in order to, to assess whether or not the person's going to get a loan. So if you go to the different scoring systems, it gets a little bit confusing for the consumer. So 35% is going to be payment history. So how well did you do making those payments? 30% is going to be the overall amount owed to all creditors. So let's say that you have $10,000 in available credit. They don't want to see that you exceed any of those credit lines by 30%. So they're okay with you using about 30% of the available credit that you have. But once you exceed that, red flags are going to start going off. Even if you have a credit card of a $200 maximum limit and you are up at 195, that's not going to bode very well on your credit score. So a good idea, what I always tell people, is that if you use a credit card, paid in full every month. Don't ever carry a balance. There's no need to carry a balance to increase your credit score. Just use your credit card throughout the month and then pay it off in full every month. And that's going to keep that credit score churning. But if you're gonna make a big purchase like a car and you're gonna finance it or a house, put that credit card away for about two months prior so it shows a zero balance. Plus banks and credit unions really like that zero balance and you don't have to explain it. <coughs> Length of credit history. In 1972, my dad got me a credit card. Thank you, dad. I never saw it because I was just a baby but it has drastically helped me with my credit score. And I didn't know about it until I was about 35, because I saw it on my credit report. That's how I figured it out. But they used to do that in the 70s. It was a time for credit. 10% for the amount of new credit, uh, that's the credit score calculation. So you'll see your credit score decline if you have not used or applied for new credit in about six to seven years. And it, will be a steady decline. So one year it was 15 points, and the next year for me it was 25 points. So it was like, what? Okay, I'll play the game. I'll open a new credit line. And so then your score bounces back up. And then the types of credit in use is 10%. So oftentimes I get people who are stressed out because they feel like they're not using credit enough. But then I look at their credit report and they've got tons of student loans. And they also have an auto loan. That's a good mix. You don't necessarily have to open up another credit card. You're all right. <coughs> but the mix does increase your score. I'd like to really just push people to go to myfico.com to get their credit scores. It is going to cost you money, but then you actually know it is a FICO score. I only do this about every two years and look at my credit score because I do this for a living. I, need, I feel like I need to go through the process. Otherwise, I can absolutely care less about what my credit score is. I don't care because I'm not utilizing credit. Um, but if I was planning to do something big, I definitely would look at what my credit score was. Oh. Okay. <coughs>
you don't have to pay for this. Um, many banks now, if you have a credit card, if you could want to know what your FICO score is, go contact your bank. Mm -hmm. um, CFPB has done recently uh, outreach at RFP for companies that do offer um, free FICO scores, and you can get this actually on a monthly basis now, so you don't have to pay anybody for it. If you already have a credit card, you can go and find out from that company what your FICO score is. Okay, but, but hopefully alarms go off and you hear free credit report or free credit score, especially the score part, because there are some companies, I'm sure you're thinking about one company, anybody? Karma. Exactly, Credit Karma. They're utilizing your information, so they're gaining information from you and selling that information on the back end. So you have to be comfortable with that in order to get your quote unquote free credit score, because basically you are providing them with something that they're selling. So be cautious. So I talked about all the free stuff that we have, but it's not bad stuff. We're not getting anything from you. So that is a very quick overview of credit reports and credit scores. It gave you some resources as far as what you can tap folks into. Um, I think I would just always be on the watch for what's coming up next. There are some changes coming when it comes to credit reports. Not enough has been said as to how they're going to implement those changes with the credit bureaus. So that's why I'm not bringing it forward. I'm kind of waiting to see what happens when the dust settles. Do we have time for a couple questions? Yeah, a couple quick questions? Yeah, so is there legislation or how do they control those that file against your credit? For example, medical, I've had some companies file in less, just past the 30 days. I mean, they've obliterated my credit scores just because of medical issues. That's one of the changes that's coming up. So it'll be that they have to wait 180 days before they file any information about that medical debt. And medical debt is really becoming a different animal entirely. Another quick, any other quick questions? We'll, we'll have another chance for more questions later. Elizabeth, do you want to go next? Sure. She's going to sit. I guess I don't. Know. All right. So I am Elizabeth Escobar, and I'm the business development manager at Express Credit Union, and I am going to talk about short-term loans. Um, so. The question is, what do you think of when you hear short-term loans? And the two things I think of are payday loans and personal loans. Um, so I have a couple definitions of what a payday loan is and what a personal loan is. Um, so payday loans are a relatively small amount of money lent at a high rate of interest on the agreement um, that it will be repaid when a borrower receives their next paycheck. A personal loan is an unsecured loan that can also be called a signature loan. Um, and it is advanced on the basis of the borrower's credit history and ability to repay the loan from personal income. Repayment is usually through fixed amount installments over a fixed term, also called the consumer, consumer personal loan. So I have an example of in the interest that um, people who get payday loans tend to pay. So. If the payday lender charges a $15 fee for every $100 borrowed, that would be a simple interest rate of 15%. But if the borrower has to repay the loan in two weeks, that 15% finance charge equates to an APR of almost 400% because of the short term. Um, one thing to note is payday loans are not typically reported to credit bureaus, so it doesn't help the borrower build their credit. Um, personal loans and short term loans are typically received from traditional financial institutions and are reported um, to the credit bureaus, making positive repayment history, allowing them to leverage this score and receive lower rates on future loans. So some alternatives to payday loans 
Um, there are many reasons people go to alternative financial services to take out payday loans. One reason is maybe they don't have the greatest credit and or they are unaware of other options that might be out there. If you hear that one of your patrons is using payday loans, ask if they've ever tried reaching out to their bank or credit union that they have an account with and ask them to go there and ask what special product they might be able to get just by having an account there. Um, second, the root reason for a person getting a payday loan may be the way that they handle their monthly finances and maybe some financial counseling is what they need. So you've heard a ton of <laughs> information today about that. So if you're hearing that they're using payday lenders, maybe a referral to one of these counseling agencies might be the catalyst for some change. Um, so I wanted to talk about the alternative payday loan in a specific product that Express Credit Union offers. Um, we have a unique small dollar payday alternative loan for our members to access to qualify this for this loan. Um, you have to be a member for Express and have to be receiving direct deposit for at least six months. Um, we don't run credit and we don't check the debt to income ratio, which is a traditional ratio that lenders look at when doing loans. Um, we just make sure that you're getting a cons constant direct deposit at our institution. Um, the amount that um, a person can get is up to $715, um, and the, me the member will qualify for half of their monthly de deposit. So if a person gets $1,000 a month, they would only qualify for $500. Um, we charge a 15% flat fee on the amount borrowed, and the repayment term is 90 days. Um, so applicants can receive four of these loans in a 12-month period. Um, and many times after the member has repaid a few of these loans, we'll pull their credit and see if we can't move them into different short-term personal loans or credit cards that are lower interest. Um, and one really unique thing about this product is once the loan is repaid in the um, specified amount of time when they haven't had any late pays, we'll deposit $25 into a Save to Win CD um, for them to start saving. So the Save to Win CD, um, it's a prize linked savings account um, and Save Twin offers the excitement of the lottery without the risk. <laughs> Members keep all the money they use to enter plus interest. Um, the, there's a limited amount of deposit deposits and limited withdrawals allow the member to, um, to set up a strong savings plan. Uh, Members have the chance to win prizes ranging from $50 to $1,000. So every time they pay off one of these payday alternative loans, we deposit $25. So if they do the four in a year, they get $100 from us just in the savings account. And we encourage them to also um, deposit additional $25 increments into the account so they have a higher chance of winning. And the cool thing is, unlike playing the lottery in this case, you don't lose because you have your savings. And there are, I think, are <laughs> six credit unions in Washington that are participating um, in the Save to Win program. Um, so other credit building loans, um, share secure credit cards, credit builder loan and auto loans. Um, so many times a person may need to get a car loan because their car broke down and they, may, and they need to go to work. Um, so if a person hasn't had credit before or they've had shaky credit history, they might be denied for that auto loan or they might get a high rate because of their limited credit. So these the first two are things people can do to be proactive. <coughs> um, the Share Secured Credit Card requires typically a deposit to be made into the financial institution. At Express, it's 120% of the credit limit. So for a $500 credit card, they would need to deposit $600 in their account. They would then have a credit card appear on their credit report. It's less risk for the financial institution um, because if they don't repay that money is held in their account to pay off the credit card. Um, but it also it builds credit just like any other credit product would. Um, the credit builder loan is a specific loan product unique to Express in probably other places. Um, I call it money on layaway. Um, so let's say someone gets a thousand dollar personal loan, we deposit that thousand dollars into their <coughs> savings account and we put a freeze on it. They then make their monthly payments, and once the loan's paid off, they get the, the $1,000 or however much that they borrowed. Um, and also, it creates the habit of making that monthly payment. 
So then once the loan's paid off, if they've made room in their budget to pay off or make that monthly payment, we often encourage people to continue depositing their monthly payment into their savings or checking account. And I have auto loans on here because a lot of times people have paid for a car with cash or they've inherited a car. Um, and if they've never had any credit history, they can use the title of the car to get money and it's held as security at the financial institution. But be aware of this because there's also a lot of predatory practices around using car titles for loans. Um, credit unions in particular, it's, um, it's a less risky way um, to lend money if the person has limited credit history. Um, so expresscu.org um, has a ton of information on it. it. has a loans tab that has all the information about the loans product, the loan products we offer. Um, it also has resources to different um, financial education um, resources out there. We as Express Credit Union do some financial education classes and we refer out um, to other companies in the area. Um, I, I'll give a little bit of uh, information about Express Credit Union. So we are on 6th and Holgate in the Soto District and we are a low income designated community development financial institution. So we have a, a unique mission of serving the un or underbanked. Um, we can, all of our accounts are free. Um, they just require a $5 deposit for the savings account and we specialize in opening accounts for people who have, may have had bad relationships with other financial institutions in the past and they aren't able to open bank accounts. Um, so we can at least op open savings accounts. And with just our one branch, um, we offer shared branching to our members. So shared branching is the network of, um, that all the credit, most of the credit unions participate in. Um, so if they can't come to our branch in Soto, there's places in Everett, down in Tacoma. Um, so yeah, we're a full service financial institution and um, definitely are out there working with a lot of the patrons that, that come into the libraries. Um, and then Balance Financial Fitness. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> um, they, we have a resource tab on our website. They are like Money Management International. Um, they offer basic financial um, money management, goal setting, credit report review, debt management, buying your first home, mortgage, delinquency, and foreclosure prevention. Um, and it is free for Express members. Any quick questions for Elizabeth? Okay, well, we'll have another chance uh, later at the end. So, Tony, do you want to sure. yeah. pick off? Mm -hmm. Give us a second here yeah. to get, get the slide deck. So, I'm here to talk about um, census student loan programs. Um, I actually titled my PowerPoint program incorrectly, so it's not just programs for those with student loan debt. We have some preventative programs as well. And I'm going to talk about, um, once again, I'm Tony Leahy, the Executive Director of Sense, aka Consumer Education and Training Services. So Sense's mission, I'll tell you a little bit about Sense before we get into the programs. Um, our mission is to help people improve their financial health. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We were co-founded in 1995 by the federal uh, bankruptcy judge, the Honorable Karen A. Overstreet, who was the first woman bankruptcy judge in the history of Washington, and veteran members of the bankruptcy bar. Um, we're funded by foundation grants, special events, program fees, and individual contributions. So if anyone has any money to donate, <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Um, so um, our volunteers, we what. We can bring to the table a, a robust group of judges and attorneys and financial professionals that can provide programs, facilitate programs, and in some cases, you know, financial counseling or coaching um, to our programs. Um, we have a robust group of volunteer attorneys. I'd like to think because we have good programs, but also maybe because we have a committed group of judicial liaisons that are involved with us. Um, we have a few bankruptcy judges, Judge Barreca, Judge Corbett, uh, Judge Heston, and Judge Overstreet, who are um, involved in all of our programming and uh, help, help with um, you know, creating the programs. Uh, Judge Overstreet has recently retired, and that means she's no longer confined by the bench. 
So she has unleashed herself on the world and since, and we think consumers have benefited as a result. Um, so um, some of our programs, uh, we have several programs for, for a diverse audience. Um, we have program, we have Money Sense. It's a two hour money management class, consumer education class for working adults. Um, we have Senior Money it features the Washington State Attorney General Bob Ferguson and Judge Overstreet um, to help seniors avoid all the scams and fraud <coughs> aimed at them. Um, we have Money Steps. Um, we, have we are in the process of completing a program for individuals who have experienced incarceration and who are reentering society. And this is our consumer education program for them. Um, we have Financial Navigation Program for Cancer Patients. Um, it, we've partnered with the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Institute, and we provide um, uh, you know, counseling and coaching and, and advice for those who have been recently diagnosed um, with cancer to help weather the storm that a diagnosis can bring. And also with the King County Bar Association, we help with the debt clinic and make change. The debt clinic, um, you get the clients get the opportunity to speak with an experienced bankruptcy attorney for half hour for free of charge in the King County area. Um, okay, so on to our, our programs involving student loan um, or student loan debt. Um, so let me bring in the student loan work group. The student loan work group um, was uh, informally convened by um, Attorney General Bob Ferguson pulling together a bunch of organizations that work in the student, realm, student loan arena. Um, and so it has three branches or subgroups or committees. The first is a legislation committee. The legislation committee is dedicated to uh, monitoring and assessing the, the, the potential um, policy and legislative changes that affect and protect borrowers. So that's one branch. The other one is litigation. Um, they keep an eye on local and our national, at any level actually, any, any litigation involving student loans. Um, and then we have the outreach and education group um, and they're charged with providing outreach and education around student loans. Um, and we see two, two uh, paths for that, or two missions of the outreach and education group. One is to provide preventative education to those before you get a student loan, you know, how to protect yourself, to services to those who already have student loans. So I'm the, the chair of the outreach and education group, and I would say that it's probably the best of the three group, but I don't want the litigation committee to sue me, so I will not say that. Um, so uh, outreach and education committee, again, pulls together um, organizations that work, work in, the, in the student loan or financial education realm. Northwest Consumer Law Center, Northwest Justice Project, Washington Student Association, Washington State Attorney General's Office, Sense, um, I have to apologize to Lynn back there. We forgot to put the BFI up here, so sorry about that, Lynn. I will make that correction. But I'm the guy who got the original title screen wrong, so uh, um, that will happen. So um, our programs that, uh, that I'm here to talk to you about, and then I'm hoping that um, you'll be involved with in some way. Um, prevention one. We have um, SLAM, and the, the Outreach and Education Committee is, uh, is designated October as Student Loan Awareness Month, or SLAM. And so in October, we're going to be going to schools, libraries, community centers, and we're going to be putting on presentation to students or anybody who is going to attend some kind of post-secondary, post-high school education or training. And um, so SLAM has two goals. We want to encourage people to attend college or get some kind of post-high school training, and then we want to show them how to wisely do that. And that's the purpose of SLAM. One of the ways we're going to do that is we've created an activity, Debt Slap Planning Activity. Debt Slap is a program created by Sense. It was originally a educational video, about a 45 minute educational video that was trying to raise awareness about how students need to make you know, wise choices right now about their future um, or they could suffer the consequences of, of big debt. Um, to show them how to do that, we created the Debt Slap Planning Activity. And the debt slap planning activity, in a nutshell, helps students assemble critical information so they can make an informed choice. And that critical information is expected income and a future budget, um, the total cost of their college or training, that's tuition and living expenses, um, accreditate, we have them assemble important information, are, is the school they're going to accredited, and you know, also avoid some of those um, scandalous or fraudulent uh, for-profit for schools. 
Um, we had them look at the retention and graduation rate of the school they're considering, and then how many of those graduates at that school are defaulting on their student loans. So we have them assemble all of this information on our worksheet or online. Um, they figure out amount that they're going to borrow, and again, this is all through the worksheet that we take them through. We point out the difference between private and federal loans. In a nutshell, federal loans are, have many more protections. Um, repayments, we talk about repayments, and we put their amount that they think they have to borrow in a 10-year and a 25-year, and we talk about the differences between that. So the 10-year plan, yes, you will pay more on a monthly basis, but your total costs will be significantly less. Um, and we talk about reducing the principal or reducing the amount you borrowed in interest rate changes as well. Um, and then we show the impact of, of what you borrowed on your future budget as an adult, you know, basically saying the, the more you're paying towards student loans, the less you have on other areas. Um, and then, of course, we leave some time to brainstorm, troubleshoot, and come up with different options. Um, so we, we definitely want people to pursue their dreams, pursue their post-secondary education or training goals. So we have different iterations of this. We can do it in 50 minutes. We can do it in an hour and a half. And we've even done a three-hour in-school field trip um, you know, worksheet, work session, where we've gone through the, the lesson. Um, to do it, uh, students or whoever's going through it needs access to the internet to assemble that information. And it can be led by a SLAM or SENSE-led volunteer. Um, it can be led by a teacher, and we hope to have available in the fall a, a, a link where it can be led by an internet host that you just click a button and it will guide whoever's in the room with you through the activity. Um, so that is SLAM. Um, so if you're interested in that, if you want to bring that to your library, um, you know, we could perhaps get a volunteer there. We could talk about that to lead it. Um, please contact me. We, again, we're, we're shooting for October or somewhere around that, you know, September, November. Um, and that is my contact information. There's, there should be a copy of this PowerPoint on the table back there, so, um, so you can grab that too. It has all this information in it. So that's one resource. Um, the other resource I want to, oh, to get the, um, you can look at our, our website, senseprogram.org. DebtSlapped has its own website as well, debtslapped.org. I did not put that on there. Um, and if you want to look at the activity, the Department of Financial Institutions has it on that um, link. So, and again, this is in the PowerPoint, which you can pick up on this resource table here. So that's if you want to check out um, the actual activity that we have them go through, the, the debt slap planning activity. So I want to transition to another resource. Um, this is both a prevention, a prevention resource and an intervention resource. The Washington State Attorney General has created the Student Loan Survival Guide. It's an excellent resource. It has information for things you, sh you should consider if you're thinking about taking out a student loan or if you're overwhelmed with student loan debt, it also has resources for you. It can be obtained at that link and the, I believe they left several cards on the resource table as well if you want to check out that. So that might be something that you or your patrons might appreciate. Okay, so now let's move on to um, those who already have student loan debt. I'm going to talk about a couple of programs. The first is our pro bono student loan project. Um, we have a panel of pro bono um, attorneys who are willing to take on a case if it's a qualified case and qualified income. Um, income is 400% of the, the federal poverty level. Um, to see if the case uh, is qualified, um, you have to be screened. And unfortunately, right now, this program is only available in the King County area. Um, there's two ways to get screened. One is to attend a debt clinic, um, and that's, again, where you speak with an attorney free of charge for a half hour. To, um, to attend the debt clinic, you have to call to make an appointment. It takes place at the, in the Senior Service Center in the Belltown area of downtown Seattle. You call the number um, up there, 267-7070, between the hours of 9 and noon, Monday through Thursday, to make your appointment. When you make your appointment, they'll give you the logistics, where it is, you know, um, what time, all that stuff. Um, so that's one way to be screened for the pro bono student loan project. The second way is to attend the Northwest Justice Project Debt Collection Defense Clinic. That takes place in the law library, the King County Courthouse here in downtown Seattle at that address. Unlike the debt <coughs> clinic, this is a drop-in, first-come, first-served clinic. So you just show up. Um, and they'll screen the case. Um, if your case is screened and qualifies for the program, 
um, you're assigned to send the, the pro bono um, coordinator for the student loan project, and he, she will assign you to a pro bono attorney. So that's one um, program for if you have student loan debt or if your patrons have student loan debt. The second one is student loan debt navigation events. And these are events organized by the Outreach and Education Committee of the Student Loan Work Group. And we hold these, um, we held our first one April 22nd right here in this very room actually. Um, and it was a very, it's about 80 people attended. It was a very successful event. Um, I'll go over just kind of the, um, the uh, agenda. So there's about a 30 to 45 minute presentation by an attorney getting everyone on the same page about student loans, essential information, then followed by a 20 to 30 minute question and answer session, and then followed by a one-on-one -on -one consultation with an attorney provided by Census Pro Bono Student Loan Project. And those consultations last 10 to 15 minutes. Um, we have another one lined up. Uh, so September 30th on Saturday from 2 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. at the University District Branch, the Seattle Public Library. Um, again, it's open to the public. Um, it takes place at that time. We're going to have attorneys there as well for the, for the consultations. Um, breaking news, we also have another one of these student loan debt navigation events Sunday, November 5th at the Beacon Hill Seattle Public Library Branch. So Sunday, November 5th, Beacon Hill branch from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. We're really excited about that as well. It's going to be the same itinerary that, that I just talked about. And potentially at your library as well. We're really excited to get this program out there. I, I had five dots. After, I'm basically throwing myself at you, asking you to have this program at your library. Um, so we would love to... Uh, to, to do this, of course, the further we get away from, from King County, the, the more difficult it is, but we can talk about that. You know, we've talked about maybe streaming something or a webinar or semi-live webinar or something like that. Um, so uh, this is what the, the presentation covers. Um, types of loans, how to find out what type you have, defaulted loans and how to deal with them, finding an affordable payment plan, changing payment plans, um, loan forgiveness, dealing with collection activity, specific issues related to private student loans, pros and cons of filing for bankruptcy, scams and frauds to watch out for, and resources for self-help and further assistance. Um, so if you are interested in SLAM or a student loan debt navigation event, please, please contact me. My information's on the PowerPoint, which is uh, on the table, like I said. Um, you know, again, we can try to provide something in person, streaming, live or semi-live. Um, contact information. So um, if you think that would benefit you or your patrons, uh, please be in contact with me. And the rest of the, the PowerPoint is, is just additional resources um, up around student loans that you may be interested in. We don't need to go through it all, but it's, it's on the, uh, the sheet. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about these programs. I really appreciate it. So any questions uh, for Tony? Right off. Okay, well, why don't we move on to uh, Melody? Do you want to stand or sit? Yeah, I'm a stander, so <laughs> when I talk, I'm sure. There's a, um, Julie's got a, uh, a mic there. Uh, so, I, this is not on. Okay. Um, when the red light is on, it should yeah. be on. Hello? Uh, so I actually asked to go last, and then I sort of thought about that after everybody was talking that maybe I made a bad decision, but <laughs> I'll wake you guys up. Uh, I work for Homesight, and we are located in Southeast Seattle. We are a nonprofit, 501c3. We also are CDFI, as Express Credit Union is. We've been around for, probably should update that, 27 years in October, uh, actually. We started out as a developer and a down payment assistance provider out of necessity because the houses that we were developing for low income individuals, they need a little more money to get into those homes. Uh, we promote social and economic equity to preserve and enhance economically and culturally diverse communities through affordable home ownership, business development, and community advocacy. This is actually a new mission. We revised our mission statement last year um, <coughs> sort of to stand our ground in the Southeast Seattle area with all of the um, sort of improvements coming in and the development, we found that a lot of our community members needed our support. So I want to talk about 
talk about mortgage. Uh, there's two kinds of mortgage people. There's those who love mortgage, talk about it, even when people's faces go blank, we keep talking about it. How many people in the room are like that? <laughs> That's what I thought. And then there's the rest of you guys. So, so basically, were you guys here for your no? Okay. okay. Um, so that's what we're here for, frankly, um, is to try to give you some basis around mortgage, talk about what's involved. We're going to do a high level, what affects mortgage, what affects mortgage approval, and if you're working with someone, some resources so that you can give them some information and places to start. Uh, these are called the four C's of, of credit also, but this is for mortgage. You might have that statement in a couple places. Um, capacity. That's the income that the, the individual you're talking to has to qualify for a mortgage, how much they're going to qualify for, how predictable that income is. Credit, we heard all about that. I also asked to go last because everything they were going to say was going to relate to what we were going to talk about. So what does your credit look like? Do you have credit? Do you have poor credit? Do you not have enough credit? Is your debt too much? Because you have too much credit. Mm -hmm. uh, capital, what are you contributing to the transaction? And then what's the property that you're purchasing? What's the condition? That's the guarantee for your lender. So all of these are factors, and every time you're, and anyone is applying for a mortgage, all of these are going to play a major part in that process. Um, some very typical first mortgage programs that you're probably accustomed to seeing. It's going to be your conventional program, FHA, VA, USDA Guaranteed Loan, and USDA 502 Direct Loan. Who's familiar with these two loans on the bottom, Guaranteed and 502 Direct? So guaranteed, you can only access through a lender who's participating with rural development through USDA. 502 direct, you're going directly to USDA to apply for your product. So you're not going to have a lender in between you. Um, maybe your nonprofit is helping to structure that if you're working with them if they're a developer. And it's only available, either one of those, in a designated rural area, which of course is not Seattle. So the steps to home ownership. I'm a housing counselor, as my bio said. This is my preferred path. It's not where everybody starts, and frankly, it's the most beneficial, but a buyer assessment, working with a HUD approved counselor. You can go in and get your credit report pulled. You can see your score. You pay for it, we give it to you. You get a, an action plan that says you need to save more. You need to reduce your debt. You have some credit issues. Here's our recommended path. Here's our timeline. And if we don't do that direct financial counseling, we can refer you out to somebody else. Um, getting your education. So we prefer and recommend a um, pre-purchase education class that's going to talk to you about all the steps, all the pieces involved, um, where you can get access to resources, and address some personalized questions. Your pre-approval, you're going to contact your first mortgage lender. There's a lot out there. We recommend that you talk to several and compare those options. Um, you're going to work with a realtor because you're going to be shopping for a home within your price range once you get that pre-approval. Uh, an inspection. You want that property inspected. In a market such as Seattle right now, we're seeing a lot of people waiving inspection because they want to be competitive on that bid and that offer. But the truth is you live with whatever that house looks like when it's all said and done. So what we found, because we work, we are a lender, we work with a lot of low to moderate income buyers, is that while it's challenging, and a lot of our down payment assistance requires the inspection, is much more beneficial. We have really educated our buyers to walk away from a home when an inspection is not uh, showing that the home is livable for them long term. And you just certify the inspector. Um, your final underwrite, so once you're under contract, you're going to do that final underwrite for your home. Hopefully everything will go smoothly. And then you're going to move to closing. So what I did on this right hand side is to talk about who were the major players at each of these stages for you that you should be thinking about. There may be other parties involved. If there's repairs on the property, um, <coughs> if you have, say, an H FHA loan, you may need to have some additional inspections, not just a home inspection. But these are just the key pieces. So these are the obstacles to mortgage approval. You heard some of these <laughs> earlier. Um, I kind of grouped these together because they are different. Uh, but they are the major factors. So out of all these that you guys see here, what do you think is the one that's the most important that needs to be corrected before you're able to get mortgage approval? They actually all are pretty equal. <laughs> so what do you guys hear whenever you see a commercial? Um, oh, minimum credit score. Credit score's got to get up. I have worked with people who had a 700 credit score, but they just filed bankruptcy. Mm. And if you have a bankruptcy, 
that is less than three years old, if you're FHA, you're not going to get approved unless you're being bought out of, an, out of a Chapter 13 with a home you already own. So if you're a first time home buyer, it's gonna be nearly impossible for you to get approved, regardless of your credit score, because a bankruptcy is a barrier to home ownership. If you have insufficient credit history, as we were hearing about that credit builder product that Elizabeth was talking about, if you don't have enough credit, that's the only measure when I look at your credit report. There are some loan programs that will approve you, but often they're more restrictive and there's a mortgage insurance risk placed on those programs. Um, I'm going to talk about this one right here, insufficient assets and asset movement. This is becoming a really big problem, the asset movement side. We've had three deals die in the, at the closing table, or within a week of closing in the last three months, because um, we see individuals who we can't track or source their funds. Money's coming in, money's going out, and when that's their money to close, so essentially if they're transferring funds, maybe you have some individuals who are unbanked, so they take a large chunk of cash out and drop it into their account. Mm -hmm. Even though we've had a lot of conversations, we get right to the closing table and we can't source it and they don't have enough money to close. That's been a major problem. So that's something we're really focusing on. We've added to all our pre-purchase classes to have that conversation with our clients, um, our counseling clients, and then when they become mortgage clients. Uh, resolving those obstacles. You might notice a trend. <laughs> Work with a HUD approved counseling agency to talk about where your, what path and what action plan do you need to create for poor credit, if you had a bankruptcy, if you had a foreclosure. Um, if you have insufficient income, again, talking to the um, necessary parties to get that resource. One of the reasons why I called this out about bringing up your income is that if your thought process is to get a second job or additional overtime income, while that may benefit you in a real-time situation that you could put cash aside each month, if it's very recent income, you're not going to be able to count it for mortgage qualification. So you won't count, you won't qualify for more mortgage, but you could potentially bring more cash to the table for your closing. Again, work with the HUD approved housing counseling agency. Um, if you have insufficient assets, your resolutions here are to create a savings plan to save more or work with down payment assistance products that you qualify for. Um, the big issue with down payment assistance is that they're often income restricted. They can be restricted to a region. They can be restricted to a certain population. So often, typically, is anyone here familiar with the concept of area median income? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of an average. Um, they structure it for 100%. HUD puts these numbers out every year, and it's based on household size. They typically structure around 100% for a family of four, and then they do adjustments. So if you're looking at 50% of area median income, 80%, most down payment assistance is restricted to 80 percent. A hundred percent area median income in the city of Seattle or in King County right now for one of the programs we're working on is $96,000 for a family of four and then it scales up slowly above that. Most DPA is below that. Most is at 80 percent. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. These are the resources for these obstacles. A HUD approved counseling agency, um, HUD.gov, but this is the actual direct link, so if you're looking for a counseling agency near you, you would be able to search that. When you look up this list, this list is updated saying what specialties that that particular agency provides. You'll be able to see that next to that offer. Are you guys sharing these PowerPoints? Yes. Okay, so if you can't write fast enough, you should be able to get this later. Uh, Homeownership-wa.org. Uh, that is the um, Washington State Home Ownership Center. They have a lot of resources on there as well. You'll be able to look that up. Um, down payment assistance. Uh, Washington State Housing Finance Commission is a very, very strong housing finance agency. It's very um, supportive. We lend directly with them. We offer their products ourselves. They also publish their rates every single day. They're open to the public for their products, as well as available down payment assistance and community second providers. So I strongly recommend that you check out this website because you can direct a client to them. They can start to search there and get the information they need. And then they can go to their lender asking if they provide that product. Do they provide that DPA? Do I qualify for this? And then I put us on there because we actually offer a lot of down payment assistance. HomeSite offers about 14 different types of down payment assistance. 
Some of them are geographically restricted. All of them are income restricted, but we have 80% and 100% area median income rates. One of those is LIFT, which we are administering. It's a Wells Fargo Foundation funded down payment assistance program. It is offered in King, Snohomish, and Pierce counties only. Homestead administers it, so someone has to um, apply with us directly, but they must be getting a first mortgage from one of the seven approved lenders that we work with. I'm going to see if I can say them all. I have a list in the back, but I'm going to see if I can say them all. Uh, BECU, Banner Bank, U.S. Bank, Wells Fargo, Homesite, Habitat for Humanity, King County, and U.S. Bank. So, on uh, Home Street, I guess eight now. Eight. Home Street. So we have eight lenders they could potentially be working with and access these funds. One of the key features is you can get 100% area median income or less and qualify for this product. Uh, it's a matching funds contribution, so it's tiered. There's flyers on the back table. Are they over there? I'll give you my folder. Oh, they're here. Thank you. I forgot you were handing them out. Thank you. So can I grab one of these? So this is some more details about the LIFT program that has one site's logo at the top. And then the second sheet is the official sort of flyer. So you can get some ideas around the tiers. Um, one of the key features about LIFT is that it is a matching funds program and down payment assistance counts as the borrower's contribution. So if they're accessing another DPA program, like say the house key first mortgage program through the commission, plus their opportunity DPA, which is $10,000, they then could qualify for the full lift but lift is forgiven at a rate of one third per year over three years so it's fully forgiven at seventy five hundred dollars after three years for any of you who work anywhere near mortgage or have bought a house in recent years that's almost closing costs yeah. we also offer a program for foreclosure it's called the rescue loan program it was funded out of the ago funds from the Attorney General's office, the award that came down five years ago. And we call that the Rescue Loan Program. It is up to $35,000 to bring a borrower current that is amortizing or deferred depending on their income structure. Uh, we do not pull credit. We're concerned if you overcome your hardship, if you are back on track, and will be successful if we bring you current so that you're no longer facing foreclosure. One of the key features is that you have to have been turned down for a modification. We call this our last chance uh, loan to bring somebody current. And um, individuals have to go through uh, Washington State Home Ownership Center and ask for foreclosure and get a referral. We don't work directly with clients. We work with counseling agencies who are working with clients. So if you have someone who you know potentially has some need here, that would be a really great place to start. Um, I think some of the most successful uh, opportunities that we've seen coming through here is even when individuals um, sort of can't sustain long term in their home, particularly coming out of the housing recession. We saw a lot of individuals who would have gone to foreclosure and lost their equity in their property, <coughs> two years later were able to sell, be made entirely whole again, and come away with some assets where they would have lost that at the auction block, essentially. So we think that's a really big win for a lot of global homeowners. Is and that a, is available statewide. Is there a limit amount for finance? 35,000 is the cap. Um, and that's a rear so, so often we see other sources coming together for that, but you can use it anywhere in the state of Washington. So first steps for home ownership, um, sign up for a home buyer education course or schedule a pre-purchase session with a counselor. Um, research lenders compare products, ask <coughs> questions, or set up a session if you've been um, given a pre-approval with the counselor and go over what those look like. Ask questions that maybe you feel a little uncomfortable asking your loan officer so that you have some resources when you come back to the table. Uh, this is our website and where we're located. Um, I'm the homeownership center director and if you have more information, if you'd like some more information about other DPAs or have questions, that's a great place to reach out to us. Great, thank you. So who has questions for Melody? Oh, okay. So actually, questions for anybody, so go ahead. 
Thank you. Uh, all of you would probably be able to help with this, but uh, Tony, you were speaking about uh, creating a budget for people who are getting student loans. Um, for people like students who are going to school in an area that are not necessarily familiar with, or for my population, people who are incarcerated and maybe haven't lived in the community for a long time, what are some good resources for getting an estimate for the average cost of living? We've, I, I like Google it, but there are like 800 places to get that information. Right. Um, that's a good question as far as, you know, we just base it on the, the federal, um, I think we do it uh, federal tax. Um, IRS has, you know, spending percentage um, guidelines, and that's where we base ours off of. Off of. We don't really get specific into a community. I don't know if anybody else is aware of Well, that. I do when I go out to all the teams for the NFL because if a, a player is going from Florida to San Francisco, uh, it's a very different cost of living. So Bankrate has a really good calculator, which will tell you the difference between, let's say, the Spokane market and the Seattle market. I know that if I move to Seattle, I have to make about $30,000 more to offset the cost of living. It's pretty cool. And so with the cost of living for students, the, the activity we have go, has them go to a website that is regional specific. I just don't have that website memorized, but if you're going through the program, you know, it will show you the difference if you, you know, live at home or get an apartment in Seattle versus Eastern Washington or whatnot. Um, so I, I guess I would refer you to the, to the worksheet, which you can get on that link that I, that I included up there. Other questions? No questions. Actually, I have a question. So, Julie, uh, I think you had made um, reference to the fact that um, there are some limitations on whether credit counselors can share credit reports with their clients. Is that is that what I understood you to say? For our agency, we used to provide credit reports, and then we were told that <coughs> by federal law we could no longer provide a paper copy or electronic copy. So we can tell them everything that's on the credit report, but we just cannot provide them with a printout. So the reason I ask that is because I know we did some work, that we at the CFPB did some work with FICO in the, over the past year to basically ease that restriction because I think FICO used to have contracts that would limit the ability of, of credit counselors to share the reports. So you might, you might look into that because I, I it's not my necessarily my area of expertise, but I literally sit next to the person who, who kind of owns that portfolio. So, just. yeah, I'm sure that they're aware. But usually, once they are, we have a, a so, legal team, so they can deal with that. Yeah, and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it takes a while to. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Um, I would say part of that is um, there's a difference between credit counseling and housing counseling and yeah. the kind of product. So. If they're even the agency that's doing um, is pulling a credit report for a purpose that maybe might enter debt management or anything like that, that starts to change the purpose of the credit report, which affects that. Because our clients, our housing counseling clients, pay for their credit report up front, and we have only a soft pull credit report, we are able to offer that. Okay, thanks. Okay, other questions? I work in a fairly large public library and we get lots of people coming to first time home buyers classes. And um, we, in, in public libraries, we often have a rule about meeting room use and these, these people seem to be using our meeting rooms a lot. But I was, from what you're saying, I was told that um, first time home buyers are often required to go to those classes to get their mortgage. Is that what you were saying, or is it more recommended? Um, both. Uh, I think everyone should take it, whether their mortgage requires it or not. But specific products that are intended for low to moderate income or first-time home buyers have a requirement for them to attend uh, a course so that they get some education around that before they're able to complete and close their mortgage. And so the thing that the, the sticking point with public libraries is that we can't have people selling a product in our meeting room or making money. And they always say, this is just educational. So do a lot of real estate agencies get certified to teach these classes? Is that what's going on? Or? So can I answer that a little bit? Okay. We actually wrote the book that they're going to use in those classes. 
Um, they pair up a mortgage broker and a real estate agent, and they tell them if she sells something, if he sells something, you have to report them. So they self-report on each other if they're selling product. So if you see that in your library, you want to know about it. Um, and so does the Housing Finance Commission, because they're not supposed to be doing that. They're supposed to be legitimately <coughs> just information, which is everything in here, which comes out next month. It's at the printers. Okay. Right. So those are the housing Thank you. That's a good clarification. <coughs> That's the Housing Finance Commission courses. They are um, exclusively taught by either a loan officer and a realtor, or either of those with a nonprofit agency. Um, we teach a pre-purchase class in person, which is a little longer than those courses, and it's not taught by either of those. It's taught by our um, direct contractors um, or our counselors um, for that piece. So there, there is definitely that element, and because we originate for the commission, that is one of the factors that anyone who gets certified to teach the class, you have to you get a code when you get certified to teach the class, and if you violate that and you get called out, you basically get kicked out of their program and you can't originate their loans or teach their classes. So a follow-up on that one question that you're talking about. So those people teaching, I went to one of those classes, it was a while ago, but I noticed that they were given like their business cards. Is that acceptable? Because business cards are fine, but okay. they can't say, I can get you a better deal than Joe Smith with your commission. Okay. okay. And their their all their materials, are, materials are actually that's the only thing they're allowed to do. Okay. Yeah, all their materials are actually supposed to stay on the back table. They're not supposed to provide it to you as a direct resource. Um, they give you examples of what documents look like. Uh, I'm certified to teach that class, but I don't teach that class because I manage this program. Um, and we don't. We have partnered with a real estate agent occasionally to teach a commission class, but we typically just teach it as an out-of-group counseling agency. Technically, it's supposed to stay on the back table so people can access that information. I wanted to uh, just take a moment. Uh, Day and I um, actually hosted the program that Tony uh, from San. And so I wanted to see if they to take a minute just to kind of give you guys an example of the kind of program that these folks are able to offer at the library. It's one of the most fascinating programs. So Dave, do you want to take a minute to, to, to talk about the program? Hey, everybody. Um, so really thankful for uh, Tony and Eric and um, the Attorney General's Office in Sense. Uh, for partnering with us to do these library programs and I'm very happy um, that the central library program um, as Tony said uh, about 80 people showed up uh, we got a lot of good feedback and suggestions for how to kind of go forward with it and we were uh, they told us that they wanted more programs at our libraries and so we're doing two additional programs and uh, I don't, <laughs> I'm really happy about that um, so yeah, I mean, he did a really good overview of what's covered, and so please get in touch with them. Um, they are very open to doing these at uh, your libraries, so highly recommended. I think I just want to say that it was, uh, I, I was so impressed that they had retired judges, they had uh, attorneys all lined up and wanting to help people. We have people lined up outside the door wanting to get services. And they, every single one of them get serviced by individual attention by the attorneys. And I, I know the judge was there. But, and, and I think her comment to me just resonated so much. She said, you know what? Some of the things the program, the federal government is not able to do, we need to step in. We need to help people. And the student loans is one of the things that were just eye opening for me. You know, there's so much help out there. And I just feel <coughs> so um, uh, honored that the library is, is part of that. So thank you so much, Tony you. and Eric. Other questions or comments? Okay, I think I wrapped up. This is a, this has been a great panel. Obviously, we've got the sort of the breadth of, of credit building and credit utilization, or a lot of the big pieces of it, represented on this panel. And so you kind of got to see the picture of what a lot of people experience, different parts of their lives. So we thank them again.